If you compare beer with bratwurst, and cheese with wine, or even whiskey, with donuts, then we think you can pair all of these delicious drinks with murder, conspiracies, missing persons, and more. Drink with us as you feed your craving for true crime and creepy stories. Hi, I am Jason, and this is Katie, and uh, we've got a story, right? Katie, what do you have for us? Well, I can't imagine anything more terrifying than a predator sneaking into a home and after incapacitating the parents, sexually assaulting the daughter for hours, after which the perpetrator simply disappears into the darkness. That is unless I imagine the same scenario, except instead of remaining in the home to assault the child, this evil man kidnaps the young girl and takes her somewhere else in order to more freely act upon his depraved desires. For multiple families in the suburban areas surrounding Melbourne, Australia, this wasn't a scenario they had to imagine. It was there, in the late 1980s, that an assailant terrorized this community. And to this day, his identity remains unknown. Most people know him as Mr. Cruel, but to me, he seems more like Australia's very own and very real boogeyman. Wow. Yeah, no kidding. Um, Interesting. Well, uh, to pair with that, and I really had zero (laughs) idea what any of it was except Australia. The area. Yeah. Yeah. Not even the area, like the part of the world, Australia. The Um, continent slash country. Yeah. I chose well, you know, Um, fate looked down on us because I picked a whiskey right from Melbourne, Australia. Which I think it's Melbourne. Melbourne? Yeah, but it's Melbourne. Yankees say Melbourne. Yeah. Well, I'm a Yankee, so. Yeah, you are, mate. I'm going to say it how I was taught. (laughs) Uh, all right, so we're going with Star Ward. I have heard of this bourbon. I haven't had a chance to try it, so I'm pretty excited. I've heard very good well, things Well, when in about Melbourne. It. When in Melbourne. Um, so this particular Star Ward is twofold. Uh, it's double grain. It's an Australian whiskey. Um, let's see what they say about it. All right, so twofold. A flavor-forward Australian whiskey matured in Australian red wine barrels. Hmm. This ambitious expression marries two quintessentially Australian grains, wheat and malted barley, and elementally matures them in Melbourne's intensely reactive climate. Hmm. That's one thing I'm interested in. like the climate of Melbourne. How does that affect the whiskey flavor? Now, there's another thing... Wait, let me see if I got that one. No. So a lot of their other one. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, and the other thing that I'm curious of how it affects it is um, it's finished in Australian red wine barrels. Mm. So some of that wine is going to seep in there. Which we've, not for the podcast, but we have drank red wine from, from whiskey barrels. From bourbon barrels, yeah. So I'm interested and it's always to been see really good. what the opposite is. Yeah. I, I'm interested too. I've had a couple. I think wine, and I wasn't like crazy. Bourbon's finished in wine barrels, and I wasn't crazy about it. And then there was like bourbon finished in a port barrel, and I really wasn't crazy about that. But I have had it where it works, so we'll see what this one does. Um, so twofold promises to deliver an approachable whiskey. One reason I also bought it because it's approachable. Good, I hate whis- I hate whiskeys I can't approach because they're too hot or something. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be intimidated by a really good looking whiskey. Well, I know of some whiskeys I'd be like, <laughs> you aren't ready for that. <laughs> um, let's see here with bright aromas of spice, vanilla, tropical fruits, and cereals. The palate is rounded, carrying hints of red apples and berries. The finish is delicate with soft tannins and lingering red fruits. Okay. So we'll see if any of that is true or just bullshit. I tried listening really hard, but the second you said Star Ward, I just thought of Star Wars the entire time. Yeah. Or Star Trek.
Luke, I am your whiskey. <laughs> there we go. Hmm, smells like a, a whiskey. Is that it's whiskey, right? It's not bourbon. No, it's bourbon. No, it's not bourbon. It's, it's whiskey. whiskey. It's Australian it's, it. whiskey. Well, cheers, yeah. mate. Cheers, mate. Sniff also, I just uh, went right in. it is a single malt, so it will taste a lot different than bourbon. Hmm. They said it was going to be like gentle. I don't think it is. Yeah. It's pretty gentle. Mm. <laughs> you, I don't know. Your palate isn't quite ready for whiskeys, so it's harsh Ooh. to you. My palate is used to it, and um, that 100% tastes like a single malt. Um, scotches are single malts, but scotches Ooh. are done in a certain way with peat and all that that they taste a lot different than this. <laughs> I'm not going to have words. I'm just going to sound like an owl. <laughs> <laughs> this tastes like a lot of single malts, uh, and a young single malt. It is a very young single malt. I'll say this. I don't think it's unique in terms of whiskey flavors. mm I agree. It. So I'm I'm not tasting being aged in red wine barrels. I think it's too young to get a lot of that out of it. Um, well, as we're going to see in this story, some people like young. <laughs> gross. <laughs> uh, this whiskey is two years young, which is very young for a whiskey. Um, at, at least like... I guess for enthusiasts, um, with Colorado, for instance, we we haven't had many distilleries here making bourbon or whiskeys for very long, and a lot of our whiskeys taste the same, or maybe in their own unique way, but similar because they are so young. Um, and finally, now we're getting into years where you're getting in the five year, seven year mark, and you start getting whiskeys that taste very individual to themselves. Mm. This tastes just like Stranahan's single malt to me, which is a distillery in Denver. Um, almost identical. I'm very curious what the... Uh, uh, our, our liquor store over here has some single barrels of this that are twice the... Uh, not twice, but twenty like 25% more in ABV. And um, so I didn't get those so that we didn't get too you know, crazy tonight with the podcast. Yeah. Drinking on the podcast. Um, but it did have this, um, apparently star Ward, the most awarded distillery of the year, San Francisco world spirits competition, 2022. So not too long ago, they were receiving a, well, I guess last year. So they were the last one All to receive right. the most awards of that competition. Well, I am honored then to be sipping on this whiskey from Melbourne while I tell you a terrifying unsolved crime straight from Melbourne as well. So at 4 a.m. on October 22nd, 1987, a family of four was fast asleep in the Melbourne suburb of Lower Plenty. Their sleep was undisturbed while a man wearing a dark ski mask often referred to as a balaclava, worked to remove a pane of glass from the family's living room window. After entering the home, the masked man walked into the bedroom belonging to the parents. He had with him two weapons, a knife and a gun. After rousing the two adults from their sleep, the man ordered both parents to roll over onto their stomachs. He then tied their hands together and their feet together using a knot that indicated some nautical experience. After making sure their hands and feet were securely bound, the man blindfolded and gagged both with surgical tape that he had brought with him before moving both adults to the wardrobe, assuring them that he was only there to rob the family. Next, the masked man moved into the room of the family's six-year-old son, there, he blindfolded and gagged the boy before tying him to his bed. With three of the four family members 
Seemingly out of his way, the terrifying man entered the bedroom of the 11-year-old daughter, whose identity has never been revealed. For over two hours, the man, who will eventually be given the moniker Mr. Cruel, sexually assaulted the young girl. The man would take breaks from his attacks to wander the home, at one point even making himself a meal to eat. It was during one of those breaks that the young victim would overhear Mr. Cruel making a call on the family's phone. She reported to police that he had demanded of the person on the other end of the call to move their own children or they would be the next victims. And during the course of this call, Mr. Cruel would use a strange word to refer to the person he was speaking to. He called him a bozo. Wait, so he makes a call. And the young girl overhears it. And I'm, I'm guessing you're going to tell us some more of what, like, other than just bozo. It's, it's Yes, the language <laughs> is relevant and the call is relevant. Well, yeah, that just is very strange to make a call while, like, he works for somebody. So let's keep moving. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once Mr. Cruel was finished assaulting the girl, he simply left the home, taking with him a box of classic records and one blue jacket. What the fuck? No. <laughs> As a possible and clue. Everybody's alive. Yes. Nobody's dead. Everybody's alive. Now, as a possible clue to Mr. Cruel's identity, investigators obviously would look into the family's phone records. They wanted to determine who Mr. Cruel had called. And as it would turn out, no phone call was actually ever made. <sighs> this would be one of many red herrings left by Mr. Cruel in an effort to misguide any investigation into his identity. Jeez. Mr. Cruel wouldn't strike again until December 27th, 1988. John and Julie Wills, along with their four daughters, lived a few miles southeast of Lower Plenty in the area called Ringwood. This family of six had recently been spotlighted in a local newspaper where, along with a photo of all five Wills girls, the paper published a story about how Julie Wills, the mom, had saved her daughter Sharon from a burning bed. Wow. Yeah. Uh, separate. Separate. Separate issue. Separate uh, issue. But they're already, like, famous in the area. Yes. And how far is this from the first one you told us? Kilometers. Okay. Not far at all. Okay. In the early hours of that December morning, John Wills was awakened by a man's voice whispering in his ear. As Mr. Cruel pushed the butt of a gun into John's temple, he breathed, Don't be a hero. Hmm. Mr. Cruel, wearing dark blue overalls and again a balaclava, instructed John and Julie to lay on their stomachs. Well, you, uh, you didn't already tell everybody what a balaclava is, right? I, I referenced it as a ski mask. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure, because when you said that word to me, kind of been like hey we're we're talking about this i was like balaclava what, the, what is that and then you said and then you showed it, me and i was like you mean a ski mask it's not okay but i want to <laughs> describe it as a woven head condom with holes for your eyes and your mouth yeah like <laughs> yeah but it's like knit yeah or, or it's, and you uh, have two eye holes and a mouth hole but it literally just yeah or it's one of those uh, on your head. it's like a halloween mask that makes you look like one of those little things that you squeeze a little tongue comes out <laughs> and it, all it has is just like three that's three yeah. holes like eye eyes and yep. then the mouth and you can check our instagram for how they draw this it's the most terrifying thing in the whole wide world if you search up mr cruel there's like one image of that pops up and it's like a balaclava but knitted by the devil's mom like <laughs> and isn't it the eyes like sewn shut or something on no, it. No, but they have they these kinda, weird white Yeah, they're marks. accentuated yeah, from I don't like, it. like white knits around it. Oh yeah. On each on all three holes. Yes. If so that showed up next to my terrifying. bed, I might just die of fright. Like he wouldn't even have to tie me up. I would just <laughs> <laughs> It's terrifying. 
Whatever. I'm judo chopping that <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> All right, so Mr. Cruel, wearing dark blue overalls, and again, the balaclava, instructed John and Julie to lay on their stomachs. He then bound their wrists and ankles with copper wire this time, Mm. but using the same sailor's knot as before. This couple, too, would be blindfolded and gagged with the same surgical tape that had been used during the first attack. Before leaving the terrified couple, the intruder would reassure them that he was only there for the money. Mr. Cruel did, in fact, take $35 from the couple's bedside table before leaving the room. 35 Man. Yes. How are they going to survive without $35? <laughs> Took everything. Yes. He's the, a <laughs> robber extraordinaire. Next, Mr. Cruel entered the bedroom shared by all four of the Will's daughters. Hmm. Mr. Cruel addressed 10-year-old Sharon Wills by her name. And after packing up some of Sharon's clothes, Mr. Cruel left the Will's home, this time taking young Sharon with him. It had only taken Sharon's parents about 15 minutes to break free of their bindings. But when John went to call the police, the family phone was dead. Mr. Cruel had cut the phone line. This would be one of many clues, leaving investigators confident that Mr. Krull's attacks were strategically planned. Oh, yeah. He, he had no intention of robbing anything. Well, we're going to talk about that. Uh, real, I mean, I would say so far, you just the police would be like, this dude's just got a, he's a sexual pervert, and that's his whole, that's his whole, uh, End goal. You're going to disagree with one of the experts. Oh, okay. So with no phone to call from inside the home, Sharon's father, John, ran to a neighbor's home in order to call the authorities. Obviously, there would be a significant search effort made for the girl almost immediately. Then, 18 hours later, a woman walking along Orchard Road in the nearby suburb of Bayswater would see a small girl wearing a man's white shirt and a green garbage bag, which had been pulled up around her body and secured around her shoulders. I'm having a hard time picturing this because it's, she's wearing a man's white shirt, but yes, she has a garbage bag covering her whole body. Yes. So obviously I think the woman unties the garbage bag to free her. Oh, but when they see her, she's She's, in, they see her just wandering around in a garbage bag. I don't even think she's wandering because her feet wouldn't be able to walk very well. Like it's, oh, he put her in a garbage bag in the garbage and secured it around her shoulders. And she's out. Literally in the parking lot of a high school. Is she laying down or standing up? No description. Okay. I'm just trying to yeah, picture yeah. Well, what they Well, another source upon. actually said she also had a garbage bag around her head. Oh, weird. Now, this small child would tell this woman. How old? Oh, this was 10. the 10-year-old, the right? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> my name is Sharon Wills, and I was taken from home early this morning. A man left me here and told me to go and ring home, end quote. What? It would turn out that Sharon had been blindfolded for the duration of her attack and never actually saw her attacker's face. She would tell police that he was soft-spoken. Sharon would go so far as to say that he was even gentle. Is she sexually assaulted? Yes. Mr. Cruel would feed Sharon a Vegemite sandwich. And he would also provide her with milk and lemonade to drink during her captivity. I know we're talking about heavy stuff here, but what's a Vegemite sandwich? Oh, my gosh. Okay, it's literally, it looks like Nutella, but it's like chunky and it's not sweet or delicious like Nutella. But you spread it. And I think it's like vegetables, minerals, all in a spread. It's a shit sandwich? I've contemplated (laughs) ordering it before because I really want to know what it tastes like. It's Australian. It's so, very Australian, mate. Sounds like right? uh, spreading shit on a sandwich. It kind of looks like spreading shiznut on a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Now, before dropping Sharon off on the street in front of Bayswater High School, Mr. Cruel made sure to eliminate any physical evidence that could have been on her small body. Sharon had been thoroughly washed. Her fingernails had been clipped. Even her teeth were flossed and brushed. Sharon's clothes clearly had been removed and seemingly disposed of by the perpetrator, and the garbage bag acted as a barrier preventing any other evidence to be put on her body before she was dropped off. Mm. That actually makes sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, put in the bag over to make sure no evidence. Pretty smart. Um, uh, now I'm confused. Like, well, not re- I still, it's got to be. I don't know, I guess a pervert with a conscience. You've got time to like <laughs> contemplate. We've got more attacks. I figured. I mean, we're only um, <laughs> so long in. So <laughs> I, I figured you have a little more than us for us that yes. uh, will take us past the, what, 25 minute mark. <laughs> <laughs> now, at one point during her time with Mr. Cruel, Sharon risked a peek out of her blindfold for just a moment and was able to get a look at the room where she was being held. Mm. She would describe peach full-length curtains, a double bed with a matching peach headboard, a black, brown, gray blanket, which had been draped over some type of unit opposite of where the bed was, and at the foot of the bed was a video camera and a wooden tripod. Interesting. Which Sounds like the, a hotel. That's exactly <clears throat> what I thought. Oh. But they, it's never mentioned that that was even speculated. But it. But if, I mean, I don't know much about Australia and their uh, amenities style. inside hotel bedrooms. Yeah, <laughs> they're, what they're into, just interior design wise. But I do know a lot of um, movies I've seen. I've seen some pretty messed up ones. Like, I don't know, pretty macabre ones. And that's always the feel of it. Like, I don't know, mm-hmm. just like they're stuck in the 80s or something or late yeah. 70s. Yeah. Uh, which well, I, this was I, the like, 70s yeah. and the 80s. Oh, perfect. There you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, maybe that's why they didn't think anything of it. Uh, but matching curtains with A bedspread headboard. and headboard, um, that screams hotel. I don't. That is a hundred percent what I, I thought. I don't think of. I know anybody that matches. I, like, you you kind of like make the room look good. See, with different and colors, I think but... because it's the seventies and the eighties, more homes had the stuff probably. like that going on. Whereas now it would just be hotels. Yeah, but I think maybe <clears> it was probably more commonplace during that time. Yeah, period. and I don't. Maybe they sold sets with curtains, or you were actually having like people make your bedspreads and like during the 70s and the 80s the too. women's were, the, the women's were <laughs> women were doing that stuff right you and were buying fabric and you were putting it on everything yeah. and so it's it probably matched. so much cheaper than yeah. having it already made so buy some more 500 man hours some... later and your house looked excellent <laughs> yeah and you got nothing else to do because you don't have a job no sharon would also tell police that during the time she was being held She could hear. I made a noise on the mic. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. She could hear low flying aircraft. Uh, like helicopters. It's planes. Plane. Oh, so like a little airfield. Like proximity to an airport. Hmm. Oh, I guess yeah. Any airport year round. There's Mm -hmm. gonna be low planes. Yes. After her return home, Sharon and the other five Wells family members would all sleep in one room together. Scared that Sharon's attacker would return to their home, John also invested in a security system and a golden retriever. Nice. For years, John felt immense guilt at not having been able to protect his daughter the night Mr. Cruel entered their home. I couldn't even imagine. I really couldn't. I I think from both sides of you, it's like the daughter, everything they have to live with, both daughters that were, you know, an 11 year old and a 10 year old. Um, it's unimaginable. And the parent side too. I I don't know. I guess I didn't think about that much. Well, I'll tell you this much. I don't know how they were raising young girls in Australia in the late seventies and 
80s or late 80s and early 90s, um, these girls seemed very resilient. Like, yes, something terrible happened to them, but they kind of were okay. Mm. Like descriptions of how Sharon responded, some future victims. They were very, very resilient. Just out there surviving the outback, surviving Mr. Cruel. <laughs> well, I'm sure uh, that generation all over the world is a little bit different than the generation we're raising right now. Yeah. But maybe, especially in the outback. Oh, for is. sure. Because you're dealing with uh, real life monsters, like like animals yeah. and bugs. And like, there's, you know, humans are just another... Uh, Forced foot- to be reckoned yeah. with. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're almost a footnote to everything they have to <laughs> deal with. <laughs> well, investigators would speculate that Mr. Cruel likely had seen the story in the newspaper and specifically targeted Sharon. They felt confident that mm. Mr. Cruel had watched the family leading up to the day he kidnapped Sharon. Mm. Mr. Cruel would strike again in July of 1990. Canterbury, which sits just on the outskirts of Melbourne, west of Ringwood, and south of Lower Plenty, was home to a family of well-off English citizens. It was here that the Linus family was renting a home in this prestigious neighborhood, which was also home to many Australian politicians and officials. The Linus family was actually planning on making the move back to England, and on the night of July 3rd, both Brian and Rosemary Linus, the parents, were at a farewell party being thrown for them. Both of their daughters were at home while their parents enjoyed an evening of saying goodbye to friends. Shortly after midnight, 15-year-old Fiona and 13-year-old Nicola were startled by an angry, commanding voice. The masked intruder instructed Nicola, the younger of the two, to go into another room in order to grab her school uniform from Presbyterian Ladies College, which he knew she had. Then the masked man tied Nicola's older sister, Fiona, to her bed. The girls complied with the man's orders, scared that he might use either the knife or the gun, which he had brought with him. Before leaving with Nicola, so the younger sister, Mr. Cruel told Fiona that he wanted $25,000 as a ransom for the safe return of her sister. And how, how old were the sisters again? 15 and 13. And so I think it's telling that he chose the younger sister. Yeah. He bypassed the older sister, maybe because that wasn't what he was into or he was worried that she would fight back. And he picked the younger one. Like narrowing in on his I didn't think about like the age fight range. Back. Yeah, I didn't think about the fight back factor. I just figured, <clears throat> yeah, obviously he's in too young. Mm-hmm. Um, she's close to the other two, right. so that would be the reason why. But mm, a fight back reason too is interesting. Then Mr. Cruel led Nicola, who went by Nikki, to the family's rental car. And in this vehicle, he drove Nicola about one kilometer to another location where he had parked a car. Then it was in this second vehicle that Mr. Cruel and Nicola drove away, disappearing into the darkness. The Linus parents arrived back at their home only 20 minutes after Nikki's abduction to find their car gone and their front door open. Almost immediately, a search ensued for the young girl, but no evidence as to who had taken her or where they could have gone even turned up. 36 hours after the abduction, Nicola's father, Brian, held a press conference proclaiming that he would gladly comply with the ransom demands in order to get his daughter back. However, when no kidnapper reached out to facilitate receipt of the $25,000 promised by Nicola's father, police began to consider that this ransom demand made to Fiona was nothing more than another misleading red herring designed to confuse the investigators. 
Then, on what was Nicola's 14th birthday, and a total of 50 hours after Mr. Cruel had taken her from the safety of her home, Nicola was discovered, left outside an electricity station in Kew. She was fully dressed and wrapped in a blanket. Her eyes were still taped shut, but she was alive. Jeez. So he <laughs> forewent his garbage bag situation. Yeah. It's like, that doesn't matter. Let her keep her clothes and wrapped her in a blanket. And this is 1990? Not quite, maybe. I think you said 1990. Uh, do you remember what the last 1990. one was? 1990. 88. And the one before that? 87. Mm. Okay. Is there any other instances like this that they think maybe he did? So they think that this specific perpetrator could be linked to a dozen similar attacks Hmm. um, in the early 80s. Is the reason they know for sure these... I I I think it's the balaclava. That's what I was going to ask. That's the the feature that ties... Into how the story ends but <clears throat> yeah the ski mask is mm-hmm. and the knife and the gun I suppose you don't have to do it with the ski mask every time but well Mr. Cruel did or at least these later attacks yeah now Nicola too told investigators that she had been blindfolded the entire time but just like Sharon she had risked a peek and was able to give a description of the home where she was kept and a description of the car Nicola told police that she believed the perpetrator was about 175 centimeters tall, which is about 5'7 for us Americans, and had reddish brown hair and a slight pot belly. Nicola, too, heard low-flying aircraft during her time with Mr. Cruel. That wasn't the only thing she heard. During her time as Mr. Cruel's captive, she overheard Mr. Cruel speaking as if to someone else there in the room, implying that they were not alone. But at no time did Nicola hear a second voice respond. So, is this another red herring, or is Mr. Cruel suffering from some sort of paranoid schizophrenia? And his phone call and his conversations are to him, to somebody who exists, but to everybody else, to nobody at all. I mean, one would have to conclude it is because, A, who the fuck would like be insane enough to do everything he's doing, and especially in the way he's doing it. Like, he's not robbing anybody. Oh, he took $35. Some records and a blue coat. He's not robbing anyone. He's robbing the young girls of their innocence. Stuff. Yeah, that's (laughs) the main thing. But he's doing that in this elaborate way. Like most people believe, it's just an act or a red herring. It doesn't have to be like to, I guess, to rape a child. You don't have to go to those lengths. Mm -hmm. Um, Although. I mean, you still haven't told us, you know, the end of it. At this point, he's, what, four years later, um, or three years later, and not being caught. So maybe maybe he's smart in the elaboracy of everything. Uh, but still, to come up with the elaboracy of everything, <laughs> you got to be a fucking nut job. And <laughs> that actually, like, uh, maybe that... Maybe he is schizo. A, I'd really like to look up the word elaboracy. I I, I don't used think that's it real. twice, and I was like... <laughs> so confidently, I though. I know. I, I didn't think it was real, but it also felt right, so I, I went with it. Go with, with what it. feels right. Yeah, well, I went with it. at one point, the Mr. Cruel... Yeah, this doesn't sound as good. <laughs> ...would also speak to Nikki and tell her, quote, my freedom is worth more than your life, end quote. Now, Nicola, too. What the hell does that mean? (laughs) We're going to talk about it later. Was bathed and cleaned completely before being released. 
acting on the reports of low-flying aircraft, police were able to pinpoint an area where they believed Mr. Cruel took both girls. But the area was very large. There were many homes, so this sort of targeted area was altogether unhelpful. Right. Because he's probably like a, what do they call so they, airport cities? Uh, this is my favorite. I had one article say they pinpointed a runway that they believed was responsible for the aircraft flying over where Mr. Kroll held his victims. And then it basically was Melbourne Airport. And right. maybe in the 80s, there was one runway. I don't know. Uh, out of isn't Melbourne like their largest city or second largest city in all oh, of I Australia? I didn't know, mate. I didn't look Wait, it up. Melbourne. Is, 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 it's not the capital. We had this conversation I know. before. I know we did. It is but a it's city, large. Though, right? Yes. It's not a no. Province. It's 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 a city with pretty significant surrounding suburban areas. What do you call a city that's around an airport? It's like a air 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 municipal. Air municipal. <laughs> It, Aero city space. It like course. combines well, I have no aerospace idea. and municipality. Um, oh, that's a really good question. I have no idea. Wow, well, thank you for acknowledging the good question. Yeah, that's appreciate great. Appreciate that. There is a name for it though. Now it's unfortunate that this area couldn't be more targeted because Mister Cruel would act again, and this time, it would be a very different outcome. John and Phyllis Chan were a very hardworking couple. They had three Chinese food restaurants and multiple investment properties. They usually worked 18 hours a day, leaving their three daughters at home to take care of themselves. On April 13, 1991, the three girls, Carmen, who was 13, Carly, who was 9, and Karen, who was 7, were at home in the very comfortable... Templestone District of Victoria. This 18-room mansion was protected by a two-meter high fence and electric front gates. This Saturday night, the girls had spent most of the evening in Carmen's bedroom watching TV and movies. All three girls wandered down to the kitchen for a snack at around 8.40. There, the girls ran into a masked intruder. The man wore a dark balaclava and a green-gray tracksuit. Wielding a knife, the man assured the girls that he was only there for their money. The two younger sisters were then forced into Carmen's closet. To secure the door, the masked man shoved a bed in front of the door. The two younger sisters would only need a few minutes to push on the closet door hard enough to move the bed and free themselves. However, once out of the closet, there was no sign of the masked man or their older sister. The older one was how old? Uh, let me go back up. I 13. Was keeping track. Okay. Which is the same age as his yeah. prior victim. Yeah, but I, I, I. But it's still very young. If you know, in my head, I kind of went with a little bit of odd betting there on the ages because it was what thirteen, nine, and seven. Seven. I went with the nine-year-old. No, he went for 13. But there's a connection between this current victim and the last one. All right. All right. That, and this is what I've been waiting for. So I'm, I'm, I'm coming up with something. Here. Carly and Karen immediately called their dad and told him what happened. When John arrived home, the first thing he noticed was riding on his wife's ty- Toyota Camry, <laughs> which had been parked... I have Australian accent on my mind. Toyota Camry, which had been parked out in front of the home. The words, quote, pay back Asian drug dealer, more, more to come, end quote, had been spray painted in large letters on the side of the vehicle. That's ridiculous. Once officers arrived, tracking dogs traced Carmen's scent out across the family's garden and past their tennis court. The scent then took the dogs about two, no, 300 meters away to a vacant lot where officials speculated Mr. Cruel had a vehicle waiting. Tracking dogs are so cool. I know. Man. They're magic. They are, right? Nature's, nature's detectives. Yeah. Fucking love it. <laughs> <laughs> 
The parents would hold a press conference 72 hours after the abduction in which they offered the abductor ransom money for the safe return of their daughter. The family also put an encrypted letter into a local paper with a cipher only Carmen would know, which is Whoa. just like a different level. That's like... Um, Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's cool. Um, I don't know. You just imagine... What, what did their dad do for work? <laughs> he owned Chinese food restaurants and had investment properties. Oh, weird. I, there, it's like a certain type of mind that would be like, hey, let's. Yeah, but I just love the idea fun... that they're such a cute little family that they have their own like language and secret code. And yeah. what I was going to say is <laughs> when you hear that, you kind of just imagine a well off family would have something like that. Yeah. Like they've got extra time to do that. But actually, uh, no, but these I people don't. don't. Yeah, well, our families don't actually have extra time, but they take the time. Yeah. Um, but that's really cool that they did that. Uh, did it come to anything? Well, I'm not going to tell you yet. The search for Carmen would become the largest manhunt in Australia's history. Now, you just have to love Australia. This manhunt has a name. It was called Operation Spectrum. And it would cost millions. Sounds like James Bond I know. film. It would cost millions of dollars and involved tens of thousands of man hours plus thousands of volunteer hours. But the operation had its challenges. One major issue being that the scene at the Chan house had been terribly contaminated by the first responders. <laughs> of course. Now, part of the investigation was focused on looking at any possible ties to John, the father, or his business dealings. So this is uh, John Benet Ramsey of Australia, basically? Um, <laughs> we don't know yet. I'm not saying it is, uh, but it, it, just the details you just gave us in the past yes. couple of minutes, that's... Like John Benet Ramsey happened yes. over again. Now, investigators were not willing to completely discount the spray painted vehicle just yet. But in the end, investigators would find no criminal ties or business enemies connected to any of the Chan establishments. Hmm. No uh, Asian drug lords to pay, right? No. Hmm. But okay. he did, in like this press conference, sit in like white popped collar and very cool glasses and like assured the public that he had nothing to do with drugs while looking exactly like a person who had something to do with drugs. I'm not saying he did. Oh I'm gosh. just saying he kind of <laughs> looked super cool. <laughs> he looked real cool. He's like prime time out there. Just I, I loved it. It, even my my kids missing. I, I gotta look cool. No, his wife was it's prime time like all the time. The most pitiful mess next to him, and he just looked awesome. Oh, weird. I'm telling you, did you did you connect any Jamine with this one? I like, did, have, but it was so fleeting. the ransom note isn't a ransom note. It's the graffiti on the car. That's but the ransom. Note. He didn't even. Rec yeah, I got you. And now. then. And then she just yes. disappears, like, uh, like really oddly. Obviously, Chamane was found hours later, dead, but um, yeah, no, it's yeah, some, some odd, odd connections there. And and it was it became such a popular thing because it's affluent area. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then they start looking at the dad. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now right. a three hundred thousand dollar reward was offered. And yet there was no sign of Carmen and no real evidence. How, how much? 300000 then. Oh, that's a lot. Yep. But no real evidence would be uncovered that might lead to identifying the person who kidnapped the young girl. Months would pass and the family would be left wondering what had happened to Carmen. Then on April 9th, 1992, a man out walking his dog along Edgar's Creek would stumble upon a fully decomposed skeleton. The remains would be confirmed as Carmen's. Oh, no. The autopsy would reveal that she had been shot three times in the head, execution style, and had most likely been dead for almost the entire year. When trying to make sense of why Mr. Krull's M.O. had changed, 
Phyllis, who is Carmen's mom, told investigators that Carmen was an incredibly stubborn, feisty little girl who absolutely would have fought against sexual assault. Officers speculated that Carmen might have even discovered Mr. Cruel's identity, and the words he spoke to Nicola could explain his actions. In the end, he would prove that his freedom was absolutely worth more to him than the girls' lives. When did he say that? To his previous victim, Nicola, Nikki, the one right before this The one, one. that uh, he released in a blanket. Yes. Now, Operation Spectrum continued for another four years as a means to solve Carmen's murder. This 40-person task force investigated 27,000 suspects, explored 10,000 different tips, and searched over 30,000 homes. Damn. And although the task force was never successful in identifying the man who kidnapped and murdered Carmen, they did arrest over 70 different disgusting people on charges of child pornography, which had been uncovered during their investigation. Holy shit. Yeah. Remember Sharon, an earlier victim had spotted a tripod and a camera at the foot of her bed. Uh, Are they going to find something from a previous victim? I'm hoping that they did and they're just not telling the public like sneaky American investigators. But as of now, there's there's not much hope. Well, you're giving me clues to how this is going to end. Well, Operation Spectrum would come to an end in 1994. And at that time, there would be absolutely no resolution for the Chan family or any of Mr. Cruel's prior victims. There have been several theories, however, that have developed over the years. And before I share them, do you want to share your thoughts as to who Mr. Cruel could possibly be? All right. So. I think that um, this guy is obviously a sick individual who has a um, problem with his brain where he's. It's weird. I don't like, like, I don't like using words like attracted to or fetish or anything like that when it comes to underage um, people. Yeah. Um, Because it it attaches it to a normal sexual deviancy, which um, I don't think that is. I think it's it's evil. He's a disgusting piece of crap. It's evil. I think that that's the best way to, like, this dude is evil. He's got this evil thing he's into. And um, I think he knows it's evil. And that's why we see him release all the other victims that is known to be tied to him uh, until the end. I actually, and I think he is smart enough to like create an elaborate... it's not even that elaborate. I mean, it doesn't take too far. I mean, we just don't see it very much because I think the sick individuals that like do things like this, they're sick enough that they're not, I don't know, planning it out or, you know, in any sort of way um, that we hear about. Uh, and which to me does tell me like, as far as the schizophrenia thing, maybe he actually is. Uh, but he hides it. Like, it's just like a, like he gets into the mode and then it comes out. Hmm. Other than that, he appears as a very normal person. I think he is, um, probably in something like sales and is successful. And I think he meets a lot of, uh, well to do individuals and does business with them. And that's how he learns about, the uh, girls that we know about okay. and makes his plan on how he's going to go about having his way with a girl. Okay, interesting. One popular theory is that Mr. Cruel must have been an employee or connected to a school in some way. As it would turn out, Nicola Linus and Carmen Chan both attended the same school. 
And if you recall, it was Nikki Lib- Linus, Liberty? Presbyterian. Presby- Liberty Presbyterian, I think. No, I think Presbyterian was the first word. But he knew she had that school uniform, and both girls happened to attend that specific educational establishment. The language used by Mr. Cruel also seemed to support this type of thinking. Some of the phrases said by Mr. Cruel indicated that he was choosing child-friendly language, including bozo, instead of like, you effing idiot. He used the phrase worry wart. He referred to plural individual as use, and he called the girls missy. Which I think... Is that what they said back then? <laughs> Use Missy? I don't know. Yeah, did male but they teachers believed, call, call students Missy? I could see that 100%. Okay. Now, the timing of the attacks also supported an educational connection. All of the assaults occurred during school breaks. Now, here's where you're going to disagree with our next individual. I'm, I've already got a... Uh, re- 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 Rebuttal. There we go. Rebuttal. To the school one? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going on to a next one, so no, if you'd like to fine. share it. Yeah, uh, I will share it. Um, so I still, even with everything you said, lean towards some sort of salesman. Some sort of salesman that spends a significant amount of time with uh, their client, which wouldn't be hard back then. Um because you don't have computers doing a ton of work where you, you know, do a lot from home. So you could do, it could be anyone from a car salesman to, uh, insurance to real estate. Um, those people spend a lot of time with a family at a time and they also have to have a clean language. Like they can't, they can't speak the way you normally would around uh you know folks you're trying to sell something to um so they learn uh the monikers of you know clean things you call people and whatnot also uh so like car salesmen you're probably going to spend some time a lot of time with families and a lot of different families and you're going to learn like different things they call their kids like her dad say Missy so many times. You're going to say that. Um, uh, and insurance as well. Real estate as well. Real estate's probably, I hate to lean that way because I don't want to, but um, yeah, real estate agents spend a ton of time with those families. So anyway, what makes me lean towards that sales more than education is, okay, you have two people from one school but two people not from the same school. So you got three schools involved and that more to me speaks location. So you have people going either to a certain place or hiring a certain office in town that is going to cover many towns. I would think that in the investigation, those overlapping instances would have been discovered. So I disagree with you, and so does the FBI profile, which we're going to talk about later. Ooh, all right. Let's now, another theory speculated by a man named Stephen Barron, who spent 27 years in policing, and then another 25 years as a psychologist, was that Mr. Cruel was actually just an opportunistic, skilled burglar. His thinking was that a capable burglar could become someone who assaults young girls, but a pedophile rapist could not develop the breaking and entering, a.k.a. B&E, skills demonstrated by Mr. Cruel. Why? I I agree with him. That's why I think higher intelligence. See, and I think that it, it evolved rather than devolved. I think maybe as a young younger teen he absolutely mastered the skill of breaking into somebody's home he mastered the skill of watching and picking houses that didn't have dogs that didn't have security systems that he could go into without being detected if he had never woken up those parents he could have gone in 
He could have robbed them and he could have left. And I think he might have had these deep seated desires because of his connection to education to do this with girls. And he simply married his practice skill with his desired skill. So I do agree with Stephen, which I don't normally share such like controversial like declarations, but I, I think he has something. I wanting to sexually assault girls doesn't give you the ability to sneak into houses and observe them undetected for weeks. Investigators believed he could have been watching these families for months. And he, that was why it was like years in between each attack. But that's why, that's why I think it is, uh, the opposite. I think it's the, um, sexual motivations that gives him the ability to come up with such a scheme. Um, he, I don't think he wanted to act on his. Uh, I think the family would have sexual, recognized his voice uh, if he had interacted with these families in any mm. capacity outside of the home that wasn't specific to the young girls. He would not have spoken to the parents. No, but they describe his voice. Uh, you said every a couple single times. group yeah. describes his voice, and they can say he has no accent. He sounds like an Australian. They but would they have also, recognized him if he was their real estate like agent he, or their car salesman. He speaks in this like like a darker husky voice and he could have just went Batman, Christian Bale Batman on him and just disguised his voice. Well, there's another theory that I think it's going to throw everything for a loop. Can I just say this? Uh, no. The... <laughs> <laughs> the... the uh, now I'm losing my train of thought. Um, go ahead. I'll figure it out again. You All right. Keep going. Well, others have even speculated that Mr. Cruel could be connected to law enforcement. Mm. Mr. Cruel did seem to have an advanced knowledge of forensic evidence, especially considering that it was the 80s and the 90s. In 2010, the Mr. Cruel case was revisited by a task force that went by the name Apollo. Again, Australia just kicking everybody's ass in terms of giving these things awesome names. <laughs> what the team discovered like was... Like their rocket launches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <coughs> they discovered that many of the files were unorganized, misfiled, or missing altogether. In fact, key evidence, like a piece of tape with possible DNA, was just missing. Oh, Once snap. again, spurring the idea that Mr. Cruel was actually connected to law enforcement and perhaps the missing evidence was an indication of a cover-up. Oh, man. I did think law enforcement for a second, and I don't even know why. But just, it was like, a, I guess, another... Uh, way to have knowledge to do something like that um but the evidence missing that is really weird right really weird i'm curious what and i'm sure you didn't dive too much into it but what which evidence was missing from which cases so it was i don't know the specific case but one report referred to it as a piece of tape that most likely had Mr. Cruel's DNA on it. And then I even came across another reference to actually one of the bindings. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I do remember what I was going to say before, though. The whole B&E before sexual stuff comes up. I, like, Why can it be the opposite where you... You're a creep. Uh, you have this sexual um, attachment to younger females, but you don't want to act on it. So you spend such a large amount of time just stalking. Because that's another thing, too. I mean, obviously, this guy isn't just... So this guy is a, a robber. He breaks and enters. Um, he does that well. Uh, he has his way with young children, females, and 
he also definitely is a stalker because he wouldn't like the families that he picked was so specific that he knew how to execute all his plans. So he had to spend a significant amount of time stalking, which also right in there is also peeping toms, you know, like he, he's already doing, uh, I think it starts there, the peeping part, the stalking part. And maybe he's been doing that for years and it's just not enough anymore. It's not enough to take pictures, develop his own pictures and get his thing off. It's not enough to do all that. So he has to concoct another plan and you know, he's at least of a certain intelligence to be able to do the research, read enough books. How do you break an enter? What is, you know, what's the best way to get away with it? What evidence can the cops have? Um, I mean, just amongst um, uh, entertainment, you know, books, movies, you probably can get all that evidence or all that information. Anyway, go on. That's what I was going to say before. I just remembered. Well, (laughs) the FBI was asked to create a profile of the killer, and this is what they said. Mr. Cruel may reside or work in proximity to his first or his last known attacks. He is likely to be employed or involved with a school. He will appear genuinely dedicated to students, and this may have been recognized with awards, which seem to make him above suspicion. Mr. Cruel will have kept homemade pornography, including that of his victims. Mr. Cruel will be a functional individual with steady employment, generally regarded as a good neighbor, polite and quiet, perhaps somewhat introverted, and may be involved in community projects. If he has a partner, they will have been away during the time of the attack and will know of his sexual dysfunctions, use of pornography, and school girl uniform excitement. Those around him may have noticed changes in his behavior during and after attacks, including use of alcohol, religion, missing work, appearing distant or preoccupied. Now, Australian investigators actually wound up criticizing this FBI profile. They felt that it was too general and unhelpful. And considering the FBI has developed profiles, which included the perpetrator's correct type of car and car color simply based on the details of the crime i might tend to agree with the australians on this one yeah uh i mean i've already said it a few times on our episodes we shouldn't just cover the (laughs) the cia we should cover the fbi too because they've done some things i just think they phoned this one in they didn't care which would make sense all right you got a country halfway across the world Asking you for your opinion and just one young murdered girl, three yeah sexually assaulted. But, but the for FBI, hours. the FBI is trying to figure out all their own stuff here in the United States. They're also you know trying to concoct stupid, crazy plans for other things, and they're probably handing that to the you know the new young desk jockey that you know is just like gung ho, ready to go, and he doesn't know. Uh, left to right when it comes to um, these investigations that they do and how intricate they can get. And it is general. It sounded so general. But one thing it brought up that I actually, like they didn't say it could be this person, but there's one that, why didn't we think about this? Why not um, involved in some sort of religious movement? Well, they were, it was saying that he, after these attacks, would have exhibited some sort of drastic change in his, like, no, I have to go to church as a response to his attacks. I know know what you're saying, but why not, why not some youth pastor spent time at different churches? Again, I think if the girls were all connected through some youth organization, some youth group, some church... It would have been. It would have been revealed. Would have been revealed. Yeah. Now, yeah. 
throughout the investigation, one suspect has risen to the top of the list. During the 1970s, a man named David Sprigg spent several years in jail for tying up and attacking six different girls all at knife point. And wouldn't you know it, when David's attic was searched, it would turn out that they had discovered a knife and a dark balaclava. Mm, same type? Like with the stitching? I don't think that you, stitching... Or do you even know where that, is, that image came it, from? I think it's, it's just, just terrifying. Oh, yeah. interesting. However, according to what is called the Sierra Files, again, you go Australia with your names, there are seven equally plausible suspects all having committed similar crimes and all capable of the horrible things that Mr. Cruel did. But without any physical evidence, it is unlikely that any of these suspects will be charged with a crime. It's also possible this guy's already in jail. Yeah, you know, possibly. He, there's no crime sense that match right. everything, and they might have just caught him on something else and because he is a sick individual and... Yeah. I mean, he escalated up to murder. Um, and maybe he got scared off and ran away. And maybe that too. Also, uh, I don't know much about the climate of Australia, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty freaking warm all the time. Yeah. Like, I where are these masks sold? That's a good question. The internet wasn't around. He couldn't just... Like maybe a magazine, you could order it off a magazine, I guess. You know, yeah. uh, one of the one of the airfare magazines. It's like an army surplus magazine. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. But he also had like track suits, and so he clearly wasn't just shopping at like down under, where you wear swim suits and. <laughs> you think that's awesomeness? Just what all they're the wearing time. all the time. Yeah, with their koalas riding around on their backs. <laughs> That's what I think of. That's how everybody shows up to a business meeting. Like yeah. <laughs> in Speedos and Koalas. I just picture a lineup where it's like, surfer dude, surfer dude, man in a balaclava, surfer dude, surfer dude, and a kangaroo. And this girl's like, which one? <laughs> <laughs> I do think uh, the mask has to be something they looked so deep into. They were just like, we have to be able to figure out where this thing came from. Right. And there's only so many people that would buy it here. Unless, unless, I don't know, maybe Melbourne gets very oh, cold. Can I tell you something that's really interesting that I didn't add resorts, at all? Right? No. There literally is this like series of crimes that happened kind of at the same time, like on a completely different continent in the United States of America involving like a masked perpetrator and so maybe he was not somebody who constantly lived in australia oh and he was just maybe he was a business salesman oh dear Lord. going <laughs> over to australia <laughs> mm-hmm. yep perhaps a very intelligent <laughs> business salesman lived in another country did business with australian businessmen maybe he sold balaclavas Maybe he sold something that had to do with Chinese restaurants because that dude did that. I don't know. I don't know. All right. Well, in 2011, Melbourne, Australia would be thrown back into the pits of fear after 13-year-old Bung Sirabon went missing while walking to school one day in a blue and white school girl uniform. Making people in the area wonder, could Mr. Cruel be back? Can I say one thing? Was that your end thing? No. Okay, good. I have all of, was the jacket blue? It was all the, the clothes. The jacket was blue. That he took from the I girls don't know what blue? he packed for Sharon. Mm. But three of them, I swear you mentioned blue. Um, We just, I don't know what, what. Um, Maybe not. The school girl school girl uniform from the Presbyterian school. I guess school I just imagine like, blue. Maybe that's what I do. Blue. Bla- like yeah. blue and white plaid. Like navy yeah. blue. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, go on. Well, it's been almost 13 years since Bang Siribun went missing, and the case remains unsolved. 
And whether it was Mr. Cruel or some other boogeyman, it is a bit unnerving to think about how many boogeymen seem to be walking amongst us. But there I go again, using the term boogeyman. Well, I guess it just fits. As Ellen Marie Wiseman once said, quote, it was just easier to believe in the boogeyman than to acknowledge that there are so many evil people in the world.